July 2020, British drug trafficker Robert Dawes was sentenced to 22 years in prison for his role in one of the most emblematic European drug trafficking cases of the last decade. The attempt to smuggle almost 1.4 tonnes of cocaine on an Air France flight from Caracas to Paris. There's only one way to import 1.4 tonnes of cocaine using a commercial airline, high level and widespread corruption. In Venezuela, it has not only involved corrupt airport workers and National Guard, but also top-ranking state officials. According to a US indictment, among them were President Nicolas Maduro, along with Hugo Carvajal and Diosdado Cabello, two of the most powerful members in the current administration. In France, it involved a French trafficker turned informant, whose police handler currently stands accused of helping him use his law enforcement cooperation as a front for drug trafficking. And at the centre of it all was Dawes, a transnational poly drug trafficker with contacts in high places and corrupt port officials in his pocket all around the world, according to Robert Hickenbottom, who led the investigation by the UK National Crime Agency. The case exposed how the key to cocaine trafficking today is less the extreme violence with which the trade has become synonymous, but rather corruption, and it showed the cancerous effects of the cocaine trade, which corrupts states wherever it spreads, eroding capacity and, in more extreme cases, democracy. With trafficking to Europe booming, the cocaine trade is now spreading the cancer of corruption further and quicker than ever on before on both sides of the Atlantic. Drug traffickers have two main weapons at their disposal, Captured in Pablo Escobar's infamous offer to those whose cooperation he sought, Plumo or Plato, silver or lead. Since Escobar's time, it is Plumo that has been most connected to the cocaine trade. From the Medellin cartel blowing up airliners, to Mexican cartels hanging bodies from bridges, or tossing severed heads onto dance floors. Europe has not had to endure the same levels of bloodshed as Latin America, but it too has seen extreme violence resulting from the cocaine trade. The cocaine trade is to blame for rising gun crime in Britain, according to Hickenbottom, who now heads the UK's National Firearms Targeting Centre. Our firearms cases and firearm seizures are 99% linked to the drugs trade, he said. Police sources in Spain paint a similar picture, blaming drug trade disputes for the bulk of the country's murders. Even the Netherlands, which has one of the lowest homicide rates in Europe, has seen severed head left as a narco message and innocent bystanders gunned down in drug war disputes. A family member and lawyer of a witness in a major cocaine trafficking case were murdered. The latest discovery in July 2020 was an underworld prison with multiple cells and a torture room that was set up by a cocaine trafficking group. However, while today's drug traffickers remain more than willing to use extreme violence, they also understand that this is what led to the downfall of many of their predecessors. Violence, particularly extreme violence, creates headlines and draws attention of authorities. Instead, Plata is the weapon of choice today for transnational organised crime. Corruption from drug trafficking penetrates the state at all levels, from police patrolmen to presidents, and it targets all branches of the state, the judicial, the legislative, executive and security forces. It has put justice up for sale in many Latin American countries and seen police and military not only facilitate but participate in drug trafficking and even murder. And it has placed certain governments at the service of organised crime at local and even national levels. The Air France case shines a light on perhaps the starkest example of the corrosive power of the cocaine trade corruption. When Robert Dawes was planning a major cocaine shipment in 2013, he turned to a trafficking network formed from within the state itself, the Cartel of the Sons. The Cartel of the Sons is a loose-knit network of trafficking cells embedded in the upper reaches of the Venezuelan security forces and government. The involvement of Venezuelan security forces in the cocaine trade dates as far back as the early 1990s. But it was the convergence of Hugo Chavez coming to power with a boom in trafficking through Venezuela to Europe that would shape the fate of the country. This was a process that did not happen overnight, but gradually... It developed more the arrival of Chavez as he allowed the military to get involved in drug trafficking in exchange for its loyalty. Chavez's tolerance of cocaine trafficking secured the loyalty of the corrupt security forces leadership, a priority for the president after the 2002 attempted coup against him. It has also helped support another ally, the guerrillas of the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia, FARC. Chavez supported the FARC as the ideological sympathy and as a bulwark against the geopolitical enemies, Colombia and the United States, and the FARC were heavily involved in the cocaine trade all along the Venezuela-Colombia border. 
Chavez could not, or would not, contain the corruption he had permitted. The Guardia Nacional Boliviana, GNB, and other branches of Venezuela's military went from allowing trafficking to purchasing, storing, transporting and selling cocaine, which they sourced directly from the FARC. They sold weapons for drugs. It was an exchange. Many FARC weapons had the insignias of the Venezuelan Bolivarian Republic. By the time Chavez died, in March 2013, the cocaine cancer had fully metastasized, eaten away at the legitimacy of the Bolivian Revolution. The cable of Chavista leaders that replaced him included numerous military and political leaders now accused of drug trafficking. Among them is not only Chavez's hand-picked successor, Nicolas Maduro, but also government ministers, regional governors and senior security and intelligence officials. It was shortly after Chavez's death when Robert Dawes dispatched his emissary to meet with a British national known as Charlie Brown, who was his upstream connection with the cartels of the Sun Network. Together, they made arrangements for the Air France shipment. Months later, on September 10th, over 30 suitcases filled with cocaine arrived at Caracas's Simon Bolivar International Airport. The suitcases were brought in for a worker's entrance to avoid scanners and baggage checks. They had stickers with counterfeit barcodes that were accepted by the Air France luggage system, despite not belonging to any travellers. Reception of the cocaine in France was then handled by one of France's biggest marijuana traffickers, the incarcerated Sofiane Hambly. However, unknown to Dawes and his Venezuelan partners, the operation was compromised. British undercover operatives in Venezuela had warned the French of the impending shipment using the Air France flight, and the French had set up a controlled handover operation. Hambly was a collaborator with a French police unit, the central office for the suppression of illicit drug trafficking. The seizure made international headlines and Venezuela came under pressure to respond. Authorities initially made 27 arrests, including airport workers, low-ranking members of the GMB, which is responsible for security at Venezuela's airports, and Ernesto Mora Carvajal, the GMB lieutenant colonel, and Hugo Carvajal's nephew, who had headed the airport security. Seven airport workers and three GMB officials later received sentences of between 10 and 22 years in prison. Mora Carvajal, however, was quickly declared innocent and released. There was little doubt that the true masterminds were to be found much higher up, and in 2020, the US Department of Justice accused President Maduro, Hugo Carvajal, and Diosdado Cabello of involvement in the case. Among the evidence were communications intercepts in which Maduro told Carvajal and Cabello shortly after the seizure that they should not have used Maikita Airport for drug trafficking and should stick to established trafficking routes. Venezuela is not the only example of a nation suffering corruption due to cocaine trafficking routes to Europe. The former Dutch colony of Suriname was long ruled by Desi Boutrès, first as a dictator and then as elected president. He allegedly had contact with Pablo Escobar and did arms for drug deals with the FARC in the 1990s. In 1999, Boutrès was convicted in absentia as the mastermind behind a shipment of cocaine to the Netherlands. It is clear that there are links between the state and the underworld in Suriname. Since then, cocaine routes to Europe have expanded around the region, and so has the corruption. Ecuador, and especially the port of Guayaquil, is now one of the main dispatch points to Europe. Here, drug trafficking allegations have reached the highest level of the state. In the previous administration of Rafael Correa, there were narco scandals involving government ministers, presidential allies, and even the president himself. Underworld sources in Ecuador, who spoke on the condition of anonymity, described to insight crime how police, armed forces, judges, prosecutors, public registrars, mayors, governors, and even figures in the national government are all on the payroll of cocaine traffickers. If you're not corrupt, they will corrupt you, said one, who had first-hand knowledge of drug trafficking in the Colombia border region. Another major dispatch point to Europe to emerge over the last decade is the Dominican Republic, a long-time transit route to the United States. Once again, the increase in trafficking through the country has deepened already high levels of corruption. In the Dominican Republic, decades of corruption have made politics a partner of drug trafficking, and today this has reached exorbitant levels. Drug trafficking co-op politicians begin at the local level, where sources say candidates for municipal elections are routinely bankrolled by traffickers, and their influence rises to the national level, where President Danilo Medina has faced scrutiny over his alleged links to the wife of one of the island's most notorious cocaine traffickers, Cesar Emilio Peralta, alias El Abusador. Factions of the Dominican security forces, meanwhile, have crossed the line from corruption to criminal actors, participating in everything from murder for hire to international drug trafficking. The former director of the country's anti-narcotics police was even convicted of stealing nearly a tonne of cocaine. Today, few Latin American and Caribbean countries have escaped corruption associated with cocaine trafficking. 
But while such top-level corruption seems unthinkable in Europe, further twists in the Air France case show how Europe is far from immune to the cocaine cancer. The story of the seizure presented by the head of the OCTRIS, Francois Thierry, was that a corrupt luggage handler at the airport in France was supposed to get the drugs through the airport but switched sides and told an informant of the operation. Sofiane Hambly, though, claimed in the court hearing he had organised the operation to remove the drugs from the airport from his prison cell in coordination with the police. Hambly's claims to have organised the handover are also supported by a confidential letter from Thierry to the Attorney General signed on October 28, 2015. In the letter, Thierry praises Hambly for his work, including for the seizure of 1.4 tonnes of cocaine. Hambly's cooperation with law enforcement earned him an early release from prison. However, there's evidence to suggest it may have earned him and Thierry, at the time one of France's top anti-narcotics police, a lot more. In 2016, an investigation by Liberation uncovered how Hambly and Thierry's partnership was littered with examples of suspicious behaviour. There were unauthorised operations and loads of drugs arriving and then disappearing. Customs officials noted Thierry picking up a 50 kilogram suitcase from the airport on a weekly basis for several months in 2010. Thierry claimed the suitcases were fake shipments from Bogota that he was passing through to give credibility to an informant. But prosecutors could find no records of the operations in either France or Colombia and Thierry's then girlfriend acted as Hambly's lawyer even though her expertise is not the criminal but real estate. The only certainty Sofiane H would go on to establish himself as the biggest drug trafficker in France, thanks to the protection of Francois Thierry. A year later, Thierry was indicted for criminal association. Two years after that, he was indicted again for complicity in drug trafficking. The case remained under investigation. While Thierry remains an official of the Interior Ministry, Hambly was rearrested in 2016 but then released after a two-year pre-trial detention. Like the cartels of the Suns, the story of Thierry, a top European anti-narcotics official accused of helping to traffic drugs is an extreme case, but in Europe as in Latin America, it's still just one part of a much bigger picture. Corruption in Europe might not be as widespread as Latin America, but its core elements remain the same, structural and strategically planned. According to Europol, cocaine trafficking related corruption is on the rise. The first European mafias to capitalise on large-scale cocaine trafficking, the Galicians and the Italian Mafia, already worked in spaces where they are able to penetrate and co-opt the state, but their participation in the cocaine trade took corruption to new levels. Armed with cocaine money, the Galicians infiltrated government institutions, the legal economy and politics at an unprecedented level. In the 1990s, the region of Galicia was in danger of becoming a Spanish Sicily. In Italy, cocaine riches have helped organised crime continue to penetrate even as anti-corruption measures have broken up old ways of working. In December 2019, Italian military police arrested more than 300 people on suspicion of membership of the Andrangheta, the second biggest mafia bust in Italy's history. Suspects included politicians, lawyers, accountants, a local police chief, a former member of the Italian parliament within ex-prime minister Silvio Berlusconi's Forza Italia party. The level of infiltration and control that Adrangheta have is worrying, as going to the next level. We're talking about people who are highly educated white collar. When organised crime from the Balkans moved into the cocaine trade, the region's already weak and corrupt institutions proved easily corrupted. Countries like Italy and Spain have more capacity to address corruption today, but similar efforts have yet to develop in Eastern Europe. In Eastern Europe, there's less administrative control. There have been numerous cases linking Balkans politicians and police to drug trafficking, especially in Serbia. In 2009, the head of Serbian police, Ivica Dakic, faced corruption accusations after he was twice captured on camera meeting the drug lord Raduljub Radulovic. Dakic was never charged. He managed to survive the scandal and is now the Serbian Minister of Foreign Affairs. Nonetheless, as the Hambly case shows, in most cases the biggest threat of corruption comes at the points where cocaine enters Europe. Here, people on the ground, such as port workers or customs officials, can make the difference between success and seizure. In the port of Rotterdam, for example, several customs officers have been arrested for participating in drug trafficking, including one officer who earned millions waving through contaminated containers before he was arrested and sentenced to 14 years in prison in 2017. European cocaine corridors are currently evolving and expanding. All of its 20 busiest container ports have seen cocaine seizures of over 100 kilos over the past three years. Meanwhile, cocaine routes are opening up all around Latin America, from the ports of the southern cone countries to the mouth of the Amazon River. Wherever these new routes go, the cancer of corruption follows. 
The future of the cocaine trade may well lie in the hands of these corruption networks. I hope you enjoyed this. If you did, please like, share and subscribe. And please stay tuned for part 8 coming soon.